Okay, this is me. Um, I'm Mark Starkey. I am a developer for 20 years plus. I've worked out it's about 25 years. Um, and I am 49 years young. Now, I tell you my age mainly because actually it's, I don't feel it's a, important to be in your 30s or your 20s to 30s to be a developer. Um, I've, I started on HTML and, um, and I worked on from there. I, I added CSS a lot later. Um, about 10 years ago, I started using CSS because I was making things in tables. And it's basically because I, I was working in an industry that making puppets. I was a, I'm a special effects artist, or was. And uh, I made puppets and that kind of stuff. And um, I decided to um, change my career massively and become a, a developer. Um, it was always my hobby to, to code. Um, and that's where I am now. So I've just to give you a bit of background on me, but you don't want to know about me, you want to know about what this is. So what my talk is about is about um, how to get to the point where you're going to release your product, whether it be um, a, an app, a service, um, whether it's actually uh, just a package or a plugin. It doesn't actually matter what the product is, the process is always the same. And it's going to be an adventure. I'm going to take you on an adventure through the, the, the course of, of what, I would, what I would do uh, and what I would say would probably be a reasonable practice. I'm not going to say it's best practice because someone's going to come up with something much better, I'm sure. Um, but I'm going to take you on an adventure because it's a kind of a journey. And I always find that if ever I get on a bus or a train or a plane or a boat and I'm going somewhere, you're going on a journey. Now, it doesn't have to be a physical thing of you going somewhere. It can actually be an emotional um, a spiritual journey, if you like, um, and, but that's going to take you um, a long, a long thing, uh, along your journey, along your adventure. So, what, what are the problems that you may actually come up with um, on your journey? So, the problems are your project is going to start without a plan, a goal, or actually both. Now, take for instance, you have, um, you want to create a package, and that package uh, is going to do something. You don't particularly want it to um, start badly because you're going to just have to redo it all. And you haven't got much time. You're a developer, you're busy guys and girls. You know, let's be real about it. You have little or no time, as I just said. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't get a lot of time to actually do the things that I want to do. I have to do the things that I have to do. Um, my full-time job is with a company called Turnbull Ripley, and um, I am their lead developer. And I build mainly websites. It's all like front-end stuff, integration into a back-end CMS. Um, so I don't get really much time to do my stuff, the stuff I like. And to be fair, I'm out of the house for 12 hours a day doing that. So when I get home, the last thing I really want to do is sit in front of a computer and, and code. So one of, the, one of the issues you have is you don't have uh, much time to do it. And you have to be a little bit more um, uh, good with your time. Um, OK, so and also, people get in your way. It happens every day. People get in your way. You're sat down coding quite happily um, banging away at the keyboard, and someone says, have you got a minute? Now, you can turn around and go, give us a sec, I just want to finish this. They don't want to wait, because they don't have time either. So they're going to get in the way. And you're then taken away from your project, your work, your stuff to deal with their issues, because their issues are more important to them than it is than yours are. And also, you have so many tools. Now, you have um, lots and lots of plugins, packages. Sparty has, has got a massive amount of packages. Who makes those choices? Well, to be fair, you as a developer is going to make those choices. It's all about the choice. It's all about making sure that you know the things that you want so you can make the choice to plug them in. And, and they all have to go somewhere. And there's also the case of 
that you don't know enough. Now, as I say, Sparty have a massive amount of um, products. You might not know anything about them. I, I know very little about them apart from what I've seen here and what I've read on the internet. And to be fair, uh, you know, uh, am I going to fail? Am I a fake? Uh, uh, you know, do I do I know enough? Do I do I want to know enough? You know, that's one of the things. Do you do you really want to dive into this bucket of code and um, and packages and, and and try and pull a product? You might not. You might just say, I know what I know, and I'm going to make that. So you could be a front-end developer that just does HTML, CSS, and might occasionally do JavaScript. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a big old bucket of code, and you've got to dive in somewhere. So, you know, and will you fail? Yeah, you're going to fail. I'll, I'll be honest with you. You're going to fail a lot. But don't worry about it, because that's fine. There are ways around it. So there is a beginning to this. And the beginning starts A, B, C, then you get to D, and eventually you suddenly find that you've just completely and utterly got it wrong, so you're gonna go to G, um, and then you're gonna come back to E, and then forward on to F, and then you're gonna jump over to H. So the idea is to know where you are, know what you've done, and know where you're going. And it doesn't actually matter in what order you do them, as long as you follow your plan. So, what's a good place to start? Planning. So, in the beginning, you have an idea, or somebody has an idea, your clients come to you and said, I want you to build this for me. And that could be anything, from a website, to an app, to a service, package, so on and so forth. And that planning is key, but don't overplan it. You can, you can get yourself into a list of things that you want to do. You need to make sure that you've got everything you've got in your plan, but don't overplan it. If you overplan it, you will not be able to jump to G, and you will not be able to jump all the way to S. You'll keep it loose and try and keep the plan as it is. So keep it loose, refactor later. Now, refactoring is not just code. Refactoring is the entire planning process, how it actually goes together, you can refactor that one. That's what I mean by keeping it loose. Other interested parties. Now, who out here actually has stakeholders? I'm not talking about the meat things, I'm talking about people that have a vested interest, a stakeholder, yeah? Okay, you have stakeholders? So stakeholders are a pain in the neck. Stakeholders are people that have a vested interest in your product that will try to guide you and your product past the point of what is reasonable. Now, when I say reasonable, I mean you're, you want to have your, um, your product out by a certain amount of time. You know that it's going to take you, say, two weeks to, to code this piece of code, and you want it out there. But your stakeholder is going to try and put in his bit or her bit into that code. So that's what I mean by other parties. Other people, and other people are always a, a problem. So you get around this by creating the roadmap. Now, I'm sure you've all created roadmaps, and roadmaps are essentially a list of where it's going, what the releases are, and you can break your roadmap into different sections to say, this is release candidate number one. I'm going to get to this point. And what we're talking about is that first point of your roadmap is the minimum viable product, the MVP. Now, the MVP is uh, a piece of software that you can release into the world, let it go and run free, and people can use it, and it will break, and you will fix it, but it gets to that point where people are actually engaging with your product. Now, it may be a service, uh, and you, know, you don't want the service to, to break, but actually, a lot of people don't mind if it kind of falls over occasionally. You go, hey, it doesn't work. You go, OK, I'll fix that. Bang, it's done. It may be you've missed off a comma, or you've missed off an exclamation mark, or something like that. And you've tried to, 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 to run the code, and you're doing this on your own. I mean, to be fair, I, I don't code with anybody else. I have, it's just me in the office. Um, and everything feeds through me. So have your roadmap get that to, to a point of um, um, 
ready for other people to read, and keep it open to everybody. Allow them to see it. Allow your stakeholders to see it, to read it. They can comment on it, but they cannot add things to it. They have to add the things via you, i.e. you are in control of your destiny. This is entirely up to you as the, uh, the lead developer, or if you're, if you're part of a team and you have a lead developer, he is in control of that roadmap. You can't change it if he's in charge or she's in charge, but your, your lead is the person that changes the, the, the roadmap. Nobody else changes your roadmap. It's a very important point to have. You've got to uh, allow people to actually see what you're doing, um, know where you are. You can put dates on your roadmap if you like, if it's, uh, if it's uh, time sensitive. Um, but try to keep that visible, but only accessible um, to change by you. So you ask yourselves, do I need to use this package at this point or this piece of software within, within the, the roadmap? Can I, can I get through this roadmap with not having to use 40 different packages to do something? Can I get to the MVP with, with as little effort as I possibly can? Because it's time sensitive and I really don't want to have to be learning new, new stuff. Is it an API and can I use Lumen or Laravel? You might not need to use any, any Blade stuff at all. You might actually find that it's quite, it's quite important for you to, uh, to keep it lean, uh, keep it just pumping out um, uh, JSON objects, um, you know, whatever, you, whatever you want it to do. Ask yourself the question, do I, do I actually need this? Can I feed this into a, an app that my colleague is making over um, in another company or uh, another part of your department? Do I need to add 3D party feeds? Am I scraping anything? Am I going off and, and grabbing all the data for, for all the properties in this, in, in this area? Because it happens to be a property app you're doing. Uh, am I going to use third party um, applications like uh, uh, Twitter feeds or, or um, ooh, I don't know, Facebook feeds? Am I gonna, are they going to go in there? Do I need to worry about them at this point? Actually, probably. Probably not. Most, most of the time, the, your, your app, you can actually use data that you have um, you faked. You can use Faker to, to actually do it and have a factory settings for it. Sharing functionalities. Now, when I say sharing functionalities, I don't mean sharing on Facebook or, or social media. Uh, I mean sharing the functions. Can I actually make one thing? to do lots of things. Can I actually trim this down so that I know that my, uh, my objects within my, my package are actually uh, being used by lots of different things, and can I get away with that? Can I actually make it nice and lean? Again, do, do you need, if it's a front-end development, do you need to use jQuery? Um, if you're using jQuery purely for um, um, API calls, uh, Ajax, maybe? Um, do you really actually need to use that? Why can't you use um, Axios? Why not? I mean, you have to remember you then need polyfills if you're going to use Internet Explorer. Um, is it a single page app or is it a traditional tree structure? Is it a. Um, uh, that can change a lot. I mean, if you've got a traditional tree structure, you might actually decide that you can get away and just make a CMS, you know. There's loads of them out there. Why not? Um, is it a single page app? Do I need to use Vue.js? If I use Vue.js, I can actually swap things around. I can actually be quite, quite, um, quite lean and mean with it and actually get quite, quite a nice app. But above all, stick to the plan. Don't deviate from your plan unless you've actually slotted it together and made sure that you can um, accommodate that part of the plan. If somebody comes up to you and says, I need this put in there, make sure that it can be done and it's not going to be a detrimental to the rest of your, um, your application. Now, every good journey needs to have not just a roadmap, because a roadmap is actually a written document. You need to visualize that. You need to get some kind of, uh, some people call it a wireframe. I think wireframe is more of a graphical element. And, I, and to be fair, once you start adding designers to, to, to the process, all of a sudden, everything becomes about the pixel. Everything becomes how beautiful it is. Look at the gorgeous layout. Look at the big pictures that I'm just putting up. It's all about that with designers. 
I have five designers that work with me, and it is kind of like, it's like being in a bear pit. So you need to visualize your journey. And it's all about the flow through your journey. Now, I use um, a tool on the, on the Mac, which is called MindNode. Now, I don't know if any of you have used MindNode before. Um, it's a, um, it's mind mapping. It's a mind mapping app, but it's actually really good at enabling you to visualize the journey of your application. It does visualizations of the journeys of your users. Um, and it also can do um, uh, tree structures of, of websites and stuff like that. So you can get kind of idea of where you're going to go. It's really good for user experience. If you have any, ex every, any need to, to dive into any user experience because you are uh, the entire department of you building a, a website or a, an application and you don't have a designer and you need to try and, try and figure out the where's and the how's of where it goes together, um, you can use MindNode. Now, this is a... Um, for a company called J.A. Kemp. Um, they are a, um, uh, attorneys, patent attorneys. So you may have had dealings with them. They, they deal with um, patent queries and trademarks and, and that kind of stuff. And they decided they wanted a website and they wanted it to do various different things. It was very dif uh, different like, tagging features that enabled me to, uh, to join a lot of the tables together so that when you went into a, an attorney, you found out what they'd written, what they were uh, responsible for, and, and what products they were actually involved with. Now, the, this, this kind of flow shows that each of those pages has subsections, and the, the very faint lines um, between them, can you see the faint lines? Can we that, make that bigger? Um, the, yeah, so the faint lines in between uh, are actually the connections where the user can get from one part of the, the application to another. So they, I know everything from this of where the user journeys are gonna be, and they are, um, they're important, and they were important, to explain to the client, this is why you've got over, over 150 pages in this website. This is why you've got the tagging that lists that you give us are important because this is the journey, and this is what people are going to want to find out. And we found most of this out actually through analytical data from their previous website. So this journey works quite well, and it shows you where you can go. Now, you can make assumptions on this. Um, and you can make assumptions to, to, to what you're going to do. But for, the, um, for this, we're going to keep it simple to start with, and we're just going to go for the MVP. So your application is, let's say, uh, oh, I don't know, um, a list item of some sort. It's a to-do list. Oh, we can use a to-do list, because nobody uses to-do lists, do they? Um, as an example. So the to-do list is going to be um, uh, going into the, the minimum viable product. I needed to get it out to a bunch of people. Now, the KISS um, means keep it simple, stupid. I actually don't really like simple, stupid. It makes it out that your user is a bunch of dullards. And, well, in some cases, that can be the case. Um, and I didn't say that. Um, I prefer simple safe. Now, simple safe because you don't want your user to get confused and you don't want them to leave your app and throw it across the room because it's rubbish. Oh, I can't get through this. It's just a um, Facebook. Oh, God, I can't find the button to change my identity. I can't do this. Um, my, my dad is a typical example. He's, um, He's a very um, passive-aggressive user, my, my dad. And he basically has about 12 seconds of tolerance to get from one place to another. So he'll go onto a site or onto a service, and if he can't find it within 10 seconds, he gets really aggressive. But it's like an explosive and aggressive. It's, oh, God, I hate it. And, and, and that's it. And he won't ever use the, the, the thing again. Um, many of the, the websites he's been on, he's never been back to because he just, he just said, I can't use these things. They, they could have changed them, but you have 12 seconds of, of concentration. Make it easy, keep it lean, and people will still use it to this day. Twitter is an example of that one. Now, um, 
resources for any of these things come in, in many shapes or forms. And as I said, Sparty have got a whole bunch of stuff. Um, Taylor's released some, some new stuff in Nova. Um, a whole um, bits and pieces that come in. You guys, you've probably got loads of packages that you've, you've developed for. Um, and that really is your greatest resource. Your greatest resource is actually in this room. If you turned and looked around uh, at anyone in this room, they are a great resource. They're a good resource for um, uh, not only for creating applications um, or coding, they're actually a, a great resource for a, for a bit of, um, I don't know, moral support maybe. Actually, I, I, I'm having a problem with this. I can't figure out. It's all right, mate. You're doing fine. You're going great. Don't worry about it. It's good. A bit of a pat on the back. Actually, I've got this really good application, and I, I've got an idea for an application. Uh, can I just run it past you? Now, I would say you don't sort of like shout about your application, because there's somebody that could be stood in the wings going, oh, really? OK, yeah, I'll, I'll write that down. And, and, and I'll make that application, because I'm a better coder than, than the guy on the stage who just told me what his application is. Um, and I'll, um, you know, I'll make it myself. No, you, there are people you trust, family, friends. I trust you guys. And you actually can ask them and ask them where they are. So yeah, look around. It's in this room, your greatest resource. So building these things is uh, a marathon, not a sprint. It's, it's not about coding as fast as you can, making as many problems as you can, brushing under the carpet, and then trying to sort it out later. You need to be economical with your code. You need to be um, sure that what you're doing is actually right. You're going to make mistakes. Don't worry about it. You're going to make mistakes. We all do. And it's, so within that, the marathon has got three things that are there all of the time. They, are, they, are, they, they live with you. They are the knowns, the unknowns, and the known unknowns. So I'll explain what the knowns are. The knowns are, I'm building a website. It has content, and, um, and I want about 30,000 users to use it. You know, it's an internal system. I, I work for a massive company, you know. So that's kind of the knowns. You know the things that are there. The unknowns. Um, the marketing department decides two days before this is released that they want to have all of their presentations, all of their assets um, on the website for people to download in a secure area um, which has got sign-in that only people um, from Amsterdam can actually sign in and, and get. Now, they forgot to tell you that until two days before. That is an unknown. You have no idea. You literally have no idea. If you did have an idea that it was going to happen, it would become a known unknown. So in this instance, I know it's going to have to have all these things. I have no idea what the data is. I don't know what the, the, the images are, the media files. I don't know what the, um, what the text is they want to use. But I know it's coming. So therefore, I can fake it. I can, um, I can use uh, placeholders. And you kind of know where you're going. So that's the known unknowns. Okay, They're very, very important. Right. So you've got to the point where you've got at the end of your, um, your first planning stage, and you know where you're going to go, and, and you're starting to burn out. Because I mean, this is it's a lot of meetings with stakeholders. And what I found actually is that there is some point within this, you may actually start coding straight away. Um, you need to actually step back from it. Now, stepping back from it is actually um, is a way of actually stepping back from the screen. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this. Um, where you've actually got up out of your desk, walked and made a cup of coffee, come back to the desk, and suddenly you go, that's not, that's not what I thought I was doing. I was doing something completely different. It was, uh, I can see it so clearly now. You've literally just taken your head out of the coding bucket and, and, and taken a fresh look at it. So you need to, sometimes you need to step back and, and take a break. So the other things with taking a break, all work and no play makes Jack, Jill, a dull boy or girl. It does. If you don't step back, you're going you're gonna to burn out really, really quickly. Go to the loo. 
Ross said, poop, it's all about poop. Go to the loo. There's a certain part of the brain, and it is scientifically proven, <laughs> that when you go to the toilet, you have inspiration. Why would that be? It's because your brain is too busy thinking, I need to go to the toilet. I need to wee. I just need to go to the loo. <gasps> My bladders are going to explode. I need to go to the wee. I just want to get this finished. I just want to get I need to go to the loo. No, actually, the moment you get up, walk and have a wee, the moment you've had a wee, you'll be able to solve the problem. Try it. Honestly, try it. I, I, I do it a lot. I spend so much time in the toilet. It's just unreal. Sleep. Now, we've been all been up at, at, at midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, trying to code. And then you've got to go to work the following day, unless, of course, it's the weekend, and then family things. And my kids get up at seven o'clock at the weekend, and they don't want to get up during the week. I don't know why, but that, that's what happens. Um, and you just need to get a, a decent night's sleep. But sometimes, actually, that makes you, as a developer, uh, a bit more alert and a bit more awake. Um, and Try to experiment for five days. Now, I'm going to give you an experiment. And I want you to try and do, I'll try it. Be honest with yourselves. Actually try the experiment for five days. So it's a five-day long experiment. We're talking Monday to Friday, a work week as opposed to the weekend. The weekend doesn't exist on this one because everyone wants to party like it's 1999 at the weekend. So don't look at your phone or your tablet past 7.30 at night? Do we, do we all look at our phones in the middle of the night, sat there, a little blue and glow screen, and that you're actually staring at it? Now, that process actually, um, when you go to sleep, there's a thing called melatonin. Now, melatonin is a hormone that is made up by the pineal gland in the brain. Melatonin helps you to control your daily sleep and wake cycles. Your body's internal clock, known as the circadian rhythm, influences how much melatonin the pineal gland makes, and so does the amount of light they're exposed to every day. Typically, melatonin starts to rise in the mid-late evening, and that's after sunset, and in the morning when the sun rises, and it causes you to wake up. Mobile devices, cause melatonin to stop being produced. You do not have a restful night's sleep. You'll go to sleep, but you will not have a restful night's sleep if you've been staring at your phone. You think you will, but you'll wake up feeling quite groggy. Past 7.30, turn off your phone, put it down. It's not the end of the world. You can live without it, believe me. And you will have a decent night's sleep. Do it for five days, find out how you feel on a Friday, and be honest with yourself, you'll, you'll feel a lot, a lot better. Go to bed sober. Oh no, <laughs> who goes to bed sober? Oh, no, I don't. Um, yeah, go to bed sober, don't drink. I'm, I'm talking about not drinking a lot. I'm talking about if you wanna have a beer at the end of the day, yeah, that's fine. I'm saying not drinking excessively before you go to bed just for the five days. After that, you can get absolutely blasted and it's okay. Drink up to six glasses of water a day. Everyone tells you, my mum's told me for my entire life, she still tells me to this day, drink six glasses of water a day. Now the six glasses of water is not because you need to hydrate your body and it makes your skin lovely and whatever, which it does, you know, I, I know I'm 49, but I do look about 35, if I've been told. Um, if you drink water, it flushes through your kidney. Your kidney is actually capable of doing so many more things. It actually creates vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin B12. Uh, it regulates your blood pressure, and you can't live without it. Now, the water flushes that through, causes you to create all these lovely um, uh, hormones and vitamins and things like that that actually keep you ticking over and you're going to need them when you're staring at a screen for, for eight hours a day. Now, if you have been turning off your phone, you're going to wake up when the sun comes up. Wake up, get out of bed, and make it. Don't 
lay in bed because you'll start to fall back into the sleep cycle and then you'll have a restless, uh, a, a bad experience in that, that hour, half an hour that you're in bed because the melatonin is not doing the thing in your brain that it should be doing. And make your bed. It's one less job for the day. I know it sounds really weird, doesn't it? Make your bed. God, I sound like, you know, I sound like my mum, you know. It's like, God, get up, make your bed. No, actually, it's one less job. There's one less thing to think about. And have breakfast. Have breakfast, even if it's a cup of coffee, you're actually, you're satiating your need for sustenance in the morning. Have a coffee, have breakfast, a piece of toast, something, but don't go to bed, uh, don't go out to, to work or whatever without having something to eat because it actually it's, again, it's, it's all that, it's a mindset. It's, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. I'm now gonna go to Starbucks and get myself a cup of coffee on my way to work. Avoid news and social media. Anyone heard about a guy called Donald Trump? Does he irritate the living daylights out of you? Well, in the UK, we very rarely hear about Donald Trump. What we hear about is Brexit. And it irritates the daylights out of me. I, I voted to, to stay, I've got to be honest with you. I thought it was a really dumb idea. It would make trips like these really hard not to be in Europe because then I have to have visas and all sorts of stuff. And you know, it irritates me. But if I read that in the morning, I'm thinking about that for pretty much most of my morning. In fact, if I'm talking to people at work that have read that in the morning, they're gonna wind me up even more. And it becomes a topic of conversation that stops me from focusing on what I'm doing. Anyone heard of earthing and grounding? No? Okay, earthing and grounding is, uh, is, is you grounding with, your, um, with the world. You know, it's, it sounds very hippie-ish, I know, and, but it, there's a lot, of, a lot of logic in it. There's a guy called Earth, um, sorry, um, Clint Ober, and uh, he's a lineman. He's a guy that goes through across the Midwest, and he um, has to go through uh, Native American reserves. And on his way through the Native American reserves, he actually has to talk to the leaders, the elders of those Native American reserves, and says to them, do you mind if I come through your land? This is a courtesy. I mean, he's part Native American, uh, Native American Indian himself. So he kind of feels that there is a, a personal obligation to do this, and it's, you know, it's, it's good for, for um, relations. Uh, now, every time he went to see the elder of this particular tribe, he would be uh, thinking, take your shoes off, they're killing you. And he thought, oh, well, this is, this is kind of like me going into a mosque, isn't it? Or, or, or the Japanese custom of taking your shoes off and for going into someone's house. That isn't the case at all. It's called earthing. And basically, we have developed shoes with rubber soles that earth us, uh, that stop us from being earthed to the, to the ground. Go in the five days, go out into the garden for 15, 20 minutes in the evening, if you've got a piece of grass, if not, go somewhere you can find some grass, stand there without your shoes on. Make sure there's no nails in the grass, you know, be, be sensible with it, and earth yourself for 15 minutes. You could do it longer. If you want to spend an hour there, uh, great. But you will actually notice a rise in, in your, your body's energy, okay? Like I said, it sounds really hippie-ish and has very little to do with developing yourself, but uh, it will help you as a person. And I don't just want to help you here with your work, I want to help you with your general well-being, because I think you're great people. So, five days, do that. If it stops you from moving forward, use a low-tech solution. So back to the development, we've taken our five days of relaxation, we've uh, decided that actually now is the time that I'm going to get into the product and, and, and build, this, build this sucker. Um, when you actually come into to, to creating anything, if you want to get to the, your minimum viable product, code as least as you can to get to that point. Now, that means using uh, the, the right tool. So we're going to say we're going to use Laravel to do this particular uh, product, because it's a great product, and it does a whole bunch of the stuff for you. Um, Select your tools that get to that point of uh, minimum viable product. Now, you, you might want to, at some point in your roadmap, come up with, I want to export all of my lists to an Excel thing. Do you actually need that as part of your 
minimum viable product. Is that your first release? Are you, are you worried about actually getting reports off of this thing? If not, don't put it in. It's not necessary. Your roadmap should dictate that all of the stuff that's actually necessary in there, if you don't need search, uh, I mean, use Algolia. Use it by all means. If you don't need the search, don't put it in. It's just keep it lean, low tech solution, refactor later. You can always refactor. You don't have to use the, the exact thing that you want. Um, you might sort of say, OK, well, I'm just going to put jQuery into this one and use all jQuery plugins to do all my front end stuff, because actually, that's what I want to do. But you may later on So, can I do this with Vue.js? Yeah, I can. And it'll be so much nicer. It'll be slicker. It works better. It works with the framework really well. And actually, I can implement that. But I'm gonna, um, it's going to take me twice as long to put that in as it is to do the, the quick and dirty version with, with jQuery. But actually, it's a better experience. It's a, it's a, it's a, leaner, a leaner framework to use. So using the right tools to actually get to that point. So content. If it is a website, just use something like Statamic. You don't have to just use Statamic. You can use anything you like. You could make it into a, um, a flat HTML site. Actually code it all yourself and not, not worry about it. If it doesn't do anything overly dramatic, then, then use that. If you've got a medium to large, October CMS. Now, these are a Laravel projects or products. You can extend them. And that's the whole point. The whole point of any of these things is if you can extend it, then, then start with something basic, something simple, extend it, make it, make it better. And with October, if you create a, a package that can be used on that one that they can then sell on, you then make some money off of it. Why not? Why not indeed? Uh, blogging. No, I only put Canvas on there, but yes, there are other blogging platforms are available. Um, I didn't put WordPress on there because I, I hate WordPress with a passion. Um, not because it's a particularly bad product, I just think it's the wrong product. But yeah, that's, a, that's another presentation. Um, e commerce, you've got Michael Weber or Amios. Amios is very good. I've, I've used Amios and, and, and it extended um, past the point. It actually enables you to put some, uh, your own code in there and, and style it up exactly how you want. It's actually a, it's a really good product. But Michael Weber, again, use that one. That's, that's good. Or just go on to madewithlaravel.com and have a look and see what they've got. They've got so many products on there that may actually suit what you need to get to your minimum viable product. You don't have to start from scratch. So packages, choose wisely. Choose your packages wisely. Um, they are not all created equally. Now, I'm pretty sure, and I've said many times, that if you, um, if you want to use the Sparty ones, that I'm sure they're actually pretty well maintained. Um, they look pretty impressive. I say the media, media package was actually fantastic. I'm looking forward to using that. Um, and, but there are some that are just, they're, they're not quite up. Look at your ratings, choose wisely. It's, it, it is all about your choice. You know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what are the best ones, just it's all about, all about the choice. Um, stick to the, to the basics and extend later. You can actually extend any packages that you actually put on there or, or swap them out for new ones. That's the whole, the whole beauty of this is you can swap things in and out. Um, it was one of the, uh, the things that, made, that appealed to me with Laravel is that you can swap stuff out. Um, stick with it unless it's really the worst ever choice. So once you've done something, you don't want to waste your time learning one thing and then swap to another one because Joe Bloggs has said to you, yeah, this one's a really cool package. It's the best thing ever. I'm going to use this one. Actually, if it works for you, continue with it. Again, when you've got time to come around to the um, uh, to refactoring, you can actually swap stuff out. And use the tools you know. Now, I put SAS and LESS there, and I'm not saying that this is specifically SAS or LESS. I'm saying that if you've chose to go the LESS route or the SAS route, stick with it while you're doing this. You know, the, you, um, if you watch Laracasts, um, and he talks about using different frameworks. He'll talk about less, and, and, and Jeffrey will talk about SAS. And, and, but if you start to go, oh, I'm going to jump ship, and I'm going to go from less over to SAS, you've got to learn a little bit more about something. You've got to do something else. Now, I, I personally, I use SAS, and I think it's great. I, I, I enjoy using it. It's, it's made my CSS cleaner, neater, and being as OCD as I am, it's, um, it actually works really well, keeping it all in the same, the same place. User interfaces. 
So user interfaces, we're going to build user interfaces. Um, a lot of the ones that are on, on, um, online at the moment um, use Bootstrap as well, because Bootstrap's actually pretty good. It's, um, it's big. I mean, it's, it, it does, does a lot, but you know, that doesn't everything. Um, or you can use another one. Um, Material um, CS, CSS is, is actually really good, really good uh, from Google and, uh, and the guys there. Um, but yeah, you, you can use those. Now, I currently use admin light. I have used SB admin too. There is a Laravel version of that one, but there is also a package for admin light. Now, I don't use the package. I, I use the, the, um, the framework as is, and I plug in the stuff that I want to, to do, because that's how, how I've worked. But it was only a, a couple of weeks ago, I suddenly, suddenly heard on, the, um, on Twitter that, that this thing come along, Laravel Nova. It does so much more than admin light. <laughs> I thought I've wasted, <laughs> I've wasted so much time. Um, but it does do a lot more. It's not just a, a skin. Um, it is a, a, a so much more. I mean, I could go into it, but you've probably read all the documentation. And it's, you know, I, I'm not going to go too far into it. But to be fair, my, my next project, that's, that's what I'm going to be using. It's just, it looks, it looks beautiful. It's, uh, it's a, it looks like a nice piece of kit. So. While you're going through this journey, you're going to come up against some places and things and uh, objects that you, you don't quite understand. And I, and I do every time. Every time I go into these things, uh, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm on a learning experience. I'm on a journey of, of, of knowledge. And you think, oh, God, there's so much. There's so much stuff to learn. It's just I, I, today alone, my sequel, I, I didn't understand any of it. I got into it. I just, it was straight over the top because I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm not a DB person. It's you know I, I use it in as much as I can. I can build query strings um, using Query Builder. I can use Eloquent because actually it's so much easier and collections. So it's yeah. But you've always got to try and learn something new. And, and why why not? And why not? You go to books, tutorials. Lara Cast is really good. Adam Wathen's always got something good going on his site. Um, Laravel News and the podcasts. Um, Jake Bennett and uh, Michael Drinder, they, they do a really good job. I would actually say that while you're working, don't listen to them. Don't listen to podcasts while you're working. It's a distraction. Um, give them the, the attention that you actually, uh, they deserve, because they've actually, they, they come with some really good information. If you're busy working away and you're not really listening to because I don't think anyone really listens so much. Music's fine, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is, but you know, try, um, to concentrate on that. Give that the time you actually need. Your peers and your community, a again, a great learning resource. You are all a great learning resource. You've all done things that I haven't, and I've done some stuff that you haven't. You, you can learn, learn from me, I can learn from you, and it's actually a great resource. Now, I'm not saying we should hold hands and sing Kumbaya and, um, and anything, but, uh, you know, it's... But just remember that not all opinions are right, but it doesn't make them wrong. It's just they're different. Okay? So if somebody says this package is better because it works for me, it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll actually work for you. And likewise, you could be telling people how, how one, wonderful uh, um, any of the Sparty stuff is, but it might not actually work for that person. They might want to go and use another. another um, a media pro pro uh, product. Now, a nice bit of code there. It's the only code I'm going to show you. So this was a project that I made a, a timesheet system. Now, it, would, it, it gave the ability to, um, to run projects, um, and manage customers. And uh, this particular query uh, was a bone of contention between myself and a developer that works in our Edinburgh office. And he said, it's too complicated for what it's doing. And I said, well, it does what it does, and I'm not going to change it because it's, it's fine. But he was of the opinion it was, it was too complicated. Um, he said it, was, it should not really be calling um, closures inside a clo closure like that. It's, it's, it, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. No, he couldn't offer a better, a better solution, but he wasn't, 
he wasn't wrong, that's just his opinion. He, he will probably sit and baffle over that. You guys, you look at that one and you could probably tell me there's something wrong with it. I'm pretty sure. Can anyone actually see anything wrong with it? No, I'm not gonna call you out and tell you what's wrong with it, but no, okay, wow, woohoo, win. And that's where that one comes in, imposter syndrome. Now, I suffer from this a lot. I'm suffering from it now. I'm talking to you, and I'm thinking to myself, should I, should I be telling these guys, advising these people, or telling them about anything? Uh, chances are that some of you uh, might be gaining something from this, and some of you are going, oh man, this talk was last year. I have no idea, I wasn't here last year, but you know, it's, we all feel this, and it's okay, you know, it's actually all right. It's okay to feel like, feel like that. Everyone does. Everybody feels like that. Athletes do that. They go to the, the Olympics, and they get imposter. My God, all these massive names in, in athletics. This is my first year at the Olympics. <gasps> oh no, I'm gonna fail. And actually they turn out to be really, really good because they are given the chance to do it. Because you're not alone. No, no, I'm not. I'm still in front of you, I'm not alone. Now, you are going to fail a lot. This project, you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail, and not, not to deliver, you're gonna write the wrong code, and then you're gonna delete it, and then you're going to write some more code, and then delete it. And you're gonna try it and fail, and then you're gonna come back, and you're gonna, but this, again, that's actually okay, it's okay to do that. It's all right to, 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 to not know what you're, uh, what you're doing, because you're a developer, that's the whole point of it. You're actually finding new ways, new interesting ways to actually do something. I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that it won't work. Now that was the light bulb, the inventor of the light bulb, electric light, Thomas Edison. Now he, at no point did he say that I am a failure, he just said I actually found new ways not to do it. You are, you're gonna find loads of new ways how not to do something, which is okay, it's fine. So, finally, After you've failed a lot and won and got to the end, you're gonna to wanna to stick that thing up on, on, um, on the internet and let people use it. Whether or not you just put it on, on GitHub um, or you wanna host it, host something. You, you, you can actually run your Laravel application on, on, the, uh, on the internet. There's a danger of doing something that you shouldn't be doing. And that really is, is messing about with the server that you'd actually, as a developer, I, I, don't, I don't want to go in and start partitioning servers. I certainly don't want to spin any new ones up. I don't want to start putting in configs. I don't want to do all that stuff. I'm going to give that to someone else to do. So I'm going to give that to Taylor to do. Okay, so I'm going to use Forge, and I'm going to use Envoyer, and I'm going to use GitHub, because I have been a good developer, and I have got a GitHub account, and I have, committed all of my stuff to, to GitHub, and it's actually working really, really well. And that's the point, is that you are then releasing your stuff on GitHub. And, you know, Taylor has done a really, really good job with it. Use the service. It's cheaper than you figuring out how to put on there. If you spend an entire day, it's cost you more in that one day of figuring out how to put the stuff on, onto, uh, onto a server than it has to pay Taylor for an entire year. Where's, where's the economics in that? Just $10, it, it costs, costs nothing. So, letting go. If your project gets to the point, like so many more of mine has, you can let them go. You can wave bye-bye to them. You can stick them in the digital drawer and you can lock the door and throw away the key. You don't, you don't have to go there. You can actually come back to it later if you want to and go, oh, there you are. But the worst thing is that you've, you've kind of, you've learned. If you, don't, if you don't learn anything from this one, there might be actually, you go, I, 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 I just couldn't get past this point. Um, I'm going to work on something else. And then you learn something, you go, hold on a second. That's exactly the same thing I was working on. So you can open up the drawer, get out of the project, go, oh, there you go, that fits in there, it works, but it's okay. The only thing that's stopping you from doing that is it's your precious. 
It's your ego. It's your ego that's not doing that. Just let it go. I've let probably 30 projects go because I just just didn't didn't feel like I needed to carry on. I had the timesheet problem uh, project that was three years in the making, but I let it go for about eight months of that because it just was completely and utterly baffling me what I was doing wrong. I hope you've enjoyed it. You are all great developers, I'm sure. And it's been a real pleasure for me to come and speak to you today. Um, thank you very much.